Thank you, Phil, and thank you, Jay, and North Hills, and the rest of the staff at the uh, MGA for inviting us here. So, uh, not only did I uh, go to Columbia, I actually grew up in Roslyn, not too far from here, and uh, must have driven by North Hills thousands of times growing up. And uh, first time I ever made the turn off of the uh, service road into here, so I'm very, very happy to be here. It's a beautiful place, and it's, uh, it's great. And I also want to say that I grew up, uh, my first round of golf took place at Christopher Morley, which is right down the road here. And the first hole there is a uh, 270 yard double dog leg, which at the time I had no idea what that meant, but uh, I thought that was normal for a golf course, but I realize now that it's probably not so good for pace of play. So, um, but um, anyway, I started the position last year in July, and basically uh, the pace of play initiative that the USGA started was uh, initiated by Glenn Nager, the uh, USJ president, former USJ outgoing. Well, I guess he's the former USJ president right now who uh, wanted to make pace of play uh, one of the big. Um, uh, as topics that, that the USGA should uh, cover and try to try to solve, and, and he gave a speech at the annual meeting last year in San Diego. So, um, but coming off of that, um, we we recognize that pace of play is is a big problem in in the country, and to bolster that, we we kind of um, commissioned the survey of golfers last fall, and we found that um, when we asked them to rate the factors that uh, were most important uh, in the enjoyment around the golf. Pace of play was 74% of them said pace of play was crucial. We there's this was among about 20 or so different factors, and um, surprisingly, uh, it was fourth among 20 plus factors. I didn't think it would be that high, but um, the, and, and some of the, the other factors that I thought would be higher were, weren't. So these are the three that ranked in front of it. Um, course condition was 82%. Obviously, it's a very important topic, and and so it's important to give people good course condition without spending too much money. Uh, the people they played with was, was actually more important. It actually speaks to the enjoyability factor of the game. And then the accessibility and availability of tee times is important. Again, uh, the access that people have to the golf is very important. And cost was actually seventh. It, it wasn't as high as we thought. So, um, so obviously it speaks to the fact that pace of play is very important and it should be something that we, we uh, tackle. So our, our initiative actually started uh, right the day before the 2013 US Open when we launched a series of public service announcements. Uh, there were five that we made in total. I'm sure many of you have seen. And we're bolstering the uh, while we're young promotional activities with um, by making uh, pace of play an important part of the USGA member clubs program. I'm not sure if anybody here, any of the representatives here have received any of these packets. We're kind of starting from the south and moving forward, but moving north. But um, uh, when, when you get your USGA member club packet, pace of play and tips and, and promotional materials, anything from card cards to actually little ball markers that say while we're young will be part of the program. And so awareness is a huge part of it uh, to kind of make people aware of their own pace of play and to also make people aware of some of the factors that um, uh, contribute to pace of play. So, and then uh, we also, to bolster that, we have a resource center for pace of play on usga.org, it's usga.org slash pace of play. We have those public service announcements up. We have some other videos, which I'll, I'll go in the next slide. We have some case studies of, of courses that are doing a good job of pace of play, pace of play policy. So a lot of different information. So we kind of want to want to make it a center of excellence if people want to come and learn more about pace of play from both a golfer standpoint and from a facility standpoint. And uh, one of the one of the things on, on this resource center is a six uh, video series, uh, five of the which have been completed so far. Um, you know, we, we talk about a variety of things, pace of play. These are also available on YouTube, and if you want to use these in any way at your clubs, courses, facilities, functions, whatever, please let me know. You can either embed it through youtube.com uh, slash USGA, where there, well, they'll be, or let me know and I'll send you the files. And we, we want to encourage people to use these uh, videos as much as possible. Um, obviously, uh, US Open, US Women's Open, US Senior Open, Three championships among our, the Open Championships are the biggest, most high-profile uh, things that we do, and we wanted to make sure the pace of play was not a problem at those championships. Um, uh, we got some uh, negative uh, publicity the year before in 2012, the Women's Open with, with at Black Wolf Run, where rounds were some rounds were above six hours. So we wanted to make sure that that, that wasn't a problem as much. We wanted to improve <laughs> pace of play. So we did some things um, in championships last year to improve pace of play. Anything from uh, adjusting starting time intervals. For the first time um, on, on the weekend when we went on twosomes, we went from 10 minute to 11 minute tee time intervals, which actually made a help, which, which made a, uh, a difference. We also tried to position, make sure that the things like crosswalks and, and player services, like position of water and 
acquisition of fruit and things like that were at optimal places. They may not seem, might not seem like big things, but when you put all these things together, they actually made a little bit of a difference in pace of play. And one of the important things, one of the interesting things that we thought was when we started this task force uh, prior to the championship season, this was about the same time last year, uh, the rules and competitions um, uh, staff was kind of divided as to whether we could actually improve pace of play without affecting player behavior, without asking players to do their part. And we realized that when we went when, when and did all these things, it did actually make a bit of a difference. So these are some examples. Um, you can see in the women's open, it was especially at Sabonic, it was a huge difference in the, in the uh, especially in the first round, where our average round improved by 27 minutes. Um, and we also improved at the men's open as well. And then in the last round as well, playing in two seasons, they were average by not as, not, as, not as much of a difference. The play, pace of play at the women's open in 2012 wasn't as bad in the last round, but we still made some improvements. And we'll continue to make some improvements at Piners as we go, and, and, and it'll pro provide a good uh, forum for us to talk about pace of play as, as one of our core initiatives. Um, one of the things we also did this year, earlier this year, was make a distance measuring devices allowable during our 10 amateur championships, not at the Opens, but the amateur championships. Uh, we did some testing last year at the Women's State Team Championship and also the Women's Mid-Am. We kind of uh, looked at, not only uh, did we not, not only did we look at pace of play, we also uh, took videos and pictures of players uh, using the devices and studied them. What we found was that there was no real appreciable difference in pace of play, but it didn't hurt pace of play either, so uh, in the interest of um, inclusiveness, we actually allowed pace of play. Uh, distance measuring devices. We'll do some more testing about distance measuring devices, hopefully have some more data uh, as we move forward, which I'll talk about in the data collection program. So when we talk about slow play, uh, previously, uh, you know, a lot of people shared some of the thoughts that some of our RNC folks um, believe, which was that it was primarily a player behavior problem. True players have their part to play, but there's some other things that, that, uh, that affect pace of play. Uh, for example, course design, especially in the last 20 or 30 years in a lot of parts of the country, where uh, courses are being built mainly with real estate in mind, which means a lot of distance between greens and tees, a lot of features but overindulgent cosmetics that actually add to playing times without really adding much to player, player en enjoyability. Uh, issues of course setup. Um, you know, I, I grew up playing Beth Page Black before all the renovations, and there are probably two rakes on the entire golf course. So when, when we go, I mean, I, and Gene and, and Brian, you probably want to close your ears, but when we used to play in matches, we used to, when we went to bunker, we used to play lift smooth in place before hitting out of bunkers. Um, you know, it shows that when, but people are going into these without the right sort of setup uh, design and without the sort of the right setup um, and, and facilities, it could add a lot to pace of play. Uh, facility policies, again, but to each leg was a pride. It probably did everything wrong when it came to pace play. They had, I think, seven minute tee time intervals, which just backs up play like, like the LIA this morning. So it's, it's just really not a, not a good, uh, good factor. Uh, and sometimes the sheer number of golfers, when you're trying to put, um, you know, especially at the US Open, trying to put 156 golfers through a, through a very difficult golf course, it's, it, you're bound to get poor pace of play. It's, it's really not, not, it's really unavoidable. And then uh, one, one factor is, is this we're, we're really working on this right now, is the lack of information about what's going on in the golf course right now. Um, let's say you send groups out and the third group or fourth group runs into a problem. It would be really nice to know right then, you know, as soon as possible, that they're having problems so you can go address the issue and, and kind of as, as we'll learn if one group slows down play, it just backs, backs up play for everybody else. If you can go out and, and, and solve these issues, it'll, be, it'll go a long way to, to solving pace of play. So, um, so in, in addition, uh, we want to make more facilities aware that they have an impact on pace of play. Uh, in the same survey that we asked the golfers, we also asked some facilities of questions about pace of play. And the, the dichotomy between the two is pretty interesting. There's a, there's a big disconnect between golfers and facilities when it comes to pace of play and, and their opinions of it. So for example, I asked before, 70% of golfers thought pace of play was crucial, but only 23% of, of facilities have formal programs to address pace of play. You know, it's, it's a very striking problem, and as we move forward, our, our aim is to make that 23% number go up as much as possible. I mean, we're, we're trying to educate people, we're trying to give them tools and solutions to, so that they, they are able to tackle pace of play. Um, and the other thing about pace of play is not only the amount of time that the round takes, which is, which is important, it's also the, um, the perception of time, which I'll, I'll show in a couple of slides, which is the waiting time on the course. Uh, people can... I think when it comes to enjoyability, people just hate to wait, whether it's you know, sitting in traffic or on a golf course. And for golfers, that um, they believe that it, the, the total amount of time 
and the weight, the bottlenecks that we call it, are equally disturbing when it comes to base play, whereas facilities spend well, three quarters of them are focusing more on the total time spent. And what, what we'll find is that uh, by solving some bottlenecks, it'll increase the enjoyability and, and customer satisfaction. And so another way of looking at this was we asked golfers to, to uh, estimate the amount of time that they wait at certain bottlenecks, uh, the course, 10th hole, first part three, et cetera. And they believe that the average wait was more than five minutes whereas facilities thought it was only two minutes, which is a huge difference. So we want to get those numbers more in line or reduce them in order to make base play a, a, a better, uh, or the flow, as we call it, a, a better proposition around the country. And then finally, another, another uh, question we asked was, we, we asked golfers whether they thought base play could be improved. And 40 work percent of them thought that they could at their facility, whereas only 18% of facilities thought base play could be improved at their course, which is, uh, it's it's kind of when 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 you, when you look at the when you when you have that sort of fatalistic or uh, negative uh, viewpoint, they're not going to have any programs. What we want to try to do is to teach golf, teach facilities through through educational programs that things that they do can improve pace of play and they can have an impact. So uh, again, back this is uh, just run through these real quick. Um, when we asked, we went we went to, and actually did did some research and asked people on this typical golf course. Uh, around the golf to four hours and 39 minutes, but every every fairway was open, every green was clear, and at the end when we asked them what they thought of the experience, they thought it was great. They had a, they didn't wait, they played, they played in a, in a reasonable amount of time. They thought they'd come back. Uh, conversely, uh, we went to a golf course that had this. It's a common sight, waiting on every hole, waiting on every tee. But interestingly, they actually played pretty quickly because it was a pretty easy course. It was only four hours and 32 minutes. However, because they waited on every shot, they had a very negative experience, and it, it was uh, something that they would never come back to this course. And, and so we want to try to make sure that this customer uh, satisfaction and loyalty is, is improved at every course. So um, we've all seen uh, scenes like this, but sometimes these are unavoidable because of the numbers. And I want to go through some really quickly some of the models that we were running through that, that kind of form our, our opinions and some of our policies. So uh, when we look at pace of play, this is math. Just real quickly, just to don't don't worry about it. We'll go through it. So uh, this shows what how what the factors that impact the time that it, the six the T six is the sixth group of the day. Basically, all they have control over is is the time they finish. Well, their the time that they finish is dependent on a few things. The first group out, what how long they took. The uh, difference in starting time intervals between the first and second group, and the difference in what we call cycle time. The time that it took from the first and second group. So you want these two, two times. So if, if the uh, first group and the second group had a tee time interval of eight minutes, but they finished at, at, at 12 minutes later, that adds four minutes to the six groups time. And that goes on for every group. So if, if an average of four minutes gets added to the time for every group, you're going to have, um, you, you, by the time you get to here, you've added 20 minutes to the group of the six, six group. It's, it's, I, I can run the math. I just, I'm running through this really quickly to try to get to finish because I, I realize that my a lot of time is, is kind of is kind of quick. But um, but basically, what it comes up, all these factors that that add to the time of the round for the sixth round, all the sixth group has control over is their finish time relative to the fifth group. And what what, what that means has is, is another way to look at it is like this: if you look at tee time intervals and you want them to match up with the time that it takes to finish uh, between groups. So if if you have eight minute tee time interval. Uh, and, your, and your cycle time is, is nine, 10 minutes, it'll just keep adding, every group will just add one or two minutes to each group until it goes up like this. So you want them to line up pretty pretty evenly like this as we go and make the tee time intervals. And this tee time interval thing is, is something that a lot of people have had experience with and, and, and played around with and they know that it works. But if you showed someone, especially with a, a course with very uh, narrow tee time intervals, seven, eight minutes, and, show, and, and, and tell them that they could actually improve their placement, get get more golfers on the course by increasing the team time intervals. It's something that they're really intuitively not really uh, on board with, and we, we want to come up with some data to show them that, that they can. And this is what actually happened on a real golf course uh, with, with about an eight-minute tee time interval. You can see that it just keeps going up and up and up until they reach a critical mass, and then as, as daylight starts to fade, they'll, people get speed up. It's kind of human nature. So we show the example of the uh, uh, a traffic jam uh, as, as an example of pace of play. What we actually want is for every every group to kind of be equal in terms of their starting time and, and cycle times. So we want every group to kind of troops to be like cars on a train. We want them to go go fl flow through very smoothly, very evenly, with no starts and stops, so that, that there's there's there are no bottlenecks and everything goes smoothly. Um, um, 
a lot of people look at pace play, a lot of experts that look at pace play, one of them is Lou Riccio, Dr. Lou Riccio, who was an MGA volunteer, and he's a professor at the Columbia University, and he comes from a background in transportation systems, and there's some other professors and, and academics who have studied uh, pace of play, and they come from a background of industrial engineering or operation systems, supply chains, and they, they all believe that, uh, you know, they look at golf courses as a factory, and the, and the golfers as kind of the, the product that they're pushing through, and they want to be able to measure and know exactly what's going on to get a very smooth and, and ex, ex, um, ex, the results that are, that are expectant. Uh, you know, another way to look at it is making donuts, and if you make donuts at a very equal rate, you can sell them at, 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 at you know exactly when they're coming out, you can sell them at a very even rate. However, if something goes wrong and you can't measure and make donuts at a, at a, at a very even flow, this is what happens. <laughs> So, um, for, but for a course or a tournament or a championship or any sort of competition to measure, to, to improve their pace of play, they first need to know what the pace of play is because uh, we like to, this Matt Pringle, our technical director, used this very simple slide to show that if we we're trying to measure and control temperature in our house, we use a thermostat because we first need to measure it and know exactly what we need to go up or down in order to get it to where we're going. And this is exactly what we're doing this summer uh, with, our, with our data collection program. Uh, all around the country. Um, we like to call it, uh, and until someone proves me, proves me wrong or shows me otherwise, uh, we're going to go with it. This is the largest uh, project ever to collect data of golfers in, in, in real life conditions on, in their on-course behavior. We're going to, thanks to Chevron, which is um, uh, part of their STEM, science, technology, engineering, math programs, we're, we're hiring eight PJ Bowright interns at eight SRGAs around the country, Washington State, Southern California, Colorado, Texas, Chicago District, Virginia State, uh, Philadelphia, and New Jersey State. And what they're going to do, what these interns are going to do, is go out three or four times a, a week, uh, go out to courses, and hand out these little things. These are GPS data loggers. They're about the size of a thumb drive. And as you can see, they can, they can fit in your pocket. And what they do is they collect um, your position every five seconds. It's not real time. It's not Big Brother is watching. Basically, what it does is every five seconds, it shows exactly where you're in the golf course. So what that does is enables us to track you. I mean, so we're not doing it in real time. We're not, there's no malicious intent here. And in fact, when we go out, we're just going to collect uh, your age, your handicap index, and what tees you're playing from to get a correlation uh, data of, of things to, to look out for. And basically, it tells you exactly where the bottlenecks take place. It tells you exactly how long you took on the green, how long you took from bunkers, how long, what, what distance you're hitting from. It's got so many uses we don't even know yet. But for right, right now, we want to try to collect as much data as possible. And this is what happens over the course of the day. So this has a lot of uses, pace of play for one. For example, um, we, can, we can check out the effect of tee time intervals. If, if you go from eight minutes to 10 minutes, we can tell the course, you're going to reduce your times by this. You're going to reduce your bottlenecks by this. Uh, cards versus walking, car paths only. Anything we can test for. Because right now, what, when we go out and talk to people, we tell them we, we should do this, this, or that. Um, it's based on opinion. It's not actually based on real data. So if someone, I get questions, you know, what is what is the effect of car pets only on pace of play? We don't know. I mean, I, we don't we really don't know. But 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 by by the end of this program, we'll have a better idea of exactly how much uh, effect all these things have on pace of play. <coughs> and we'll use this data for not just for pace of play, but for handicapping, uh, for equipment standards and course maintenance. Um, Jim talked about it a little bit easier about about um, naturalized areas, but. Uh, Here's what it will happen when we look at this is the course of a, a day at a golf course in, uh, in Texas. I think it's Las Vegas. And what it shows you is this is exactly where golfers scores. And there are entire areas that are being maintained right now that pe players aren't going to. And what you can do is take these areas and take them out of play. You can make them naturalized. And, and it will enable courses um, and, and superintendents to recognize the areas that they don't need to, to maintain and use those um, resources elsewhere and make them more efficient. This is kind of a, a long-term uh, project that we're doing in terms of sustainability, but it's got a lot of effects here. Uh, we'll also use uh, course uh, pace of play data to uh, make a more dynamic pace rating system. Um, since being introduced 20 years ago, pace rating system that, that was uh, established by handicapping has kind of fallen out of, out of use, and we want to try to resuscitate that, but make it more dynamic. Um, so for example, when we, when we say a pace rating is four hours and 26 minutes for a certain course, that is for the maximum, that is for a, for a foursome at the busiest time and kind of in the middle of the day. But in order to do that, because of the way a course loads and, and pace and starting times go up, 
we can go back to this data and for that course we can say that um, the first group out should play in three hours and 46 minutes. If they do that, they'll be on the same for pace rating system. Or if, if you want to play T forward, you can you can expect the savings of this much time. Or if you if you switch T time intervals, if you go eight minutes, you'll have a pace rating of four hours and 58 minutes. But if you go 10 minutes, you might have a pace rating of four hours and 28 minutes. So those are things that we want to do. But, but that'll be based on a lot of data that we're collecting. Um, again, back to things like current pets only. Uh, measure exactly where bottlenecks occur on the golf course and that this has a lot of use for course designers as well because a lot of times when they design a golf course they have no idea what what, what their design effect on the pace will be able to do that um, and so uh, what we're doing we're going to do with this all this data is 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 kind of form educational programs for all our, our associations we'll be starting with the golf course architects because it's a logical place to start we'll be able to tell them exactly <laughs> Um, what certain features of golf courses do to on pace of play. We'll also talk with PGA professionals, LPGA professionals, uh, golf course owners, superintendents, and club managers. So they'll all be on the same page when it comes to it, and they'll be able to learn exactly how their practices and, and, and their policies affect pace of play and be able to kind of um, educate them and form a lot of uh, best practices and policies going forward. So, but ultimately at the end of the day, what it comes down to is if we need to, we need to determine that uh, it's all about the bottom line. If we can't prove the pace of play improves your, your bottom line, improves your revenue, improves uh, your sustainability of your course, it really isn't worth it. So we're working on models to try to say that as, as rounds times go down, your revenue and your bottom line will go up. So that's that's what we're working on. It's a, it's a long um, long journey. It took, it took decades to get to this point. It'll take a long time to get out of it. Uh, we're working on a lot of different things once. It'll be a lot of incremental change, but hopefully 30 years from now, uh, we'll be sitting here, or, or, or we'll be um, to be able to say that we made a difference in pace play. That average times have gone down. More courses have facilities. Uh, uh, more courses and facilities have programs to attack pace play. Pace play at our championships will have gone down, and it'll be a more enjoyable, more fun, more fun game for all. So we're not expecting overnight results, but we're moving toward these facts, and we're doing it with a with a fact based approach that, that hasn't been really been done before. So with that, I know I went through real quick, but if there's any questions, you can feel free to talk to me afterwards. And I think at the end of the day, what it comes down to is, because we have the loggers from New Jersey, we'll have, a, we'll have the opportunity to test some of these loggers at, the, at your competitions, at play days, any, anything you want. If there's anything you want to know about your golf course and the way golfers behave, please let me know. Email at, G, I kind of went over the slide, gps.usga.org uh, to indicate your interest, and we'll try to get our intern up here with some loggers as much as possible. And we'll also try to see if we can do something at the uh, Women's Amateur, which is being held at Nassau Country Club uh, this, this summer.